Hello and good morning. This is Nina Avery. I have been attending Islington Baptist Church since 2004 and I've really enjoyed it. Now, here is my beloved husband, Kevin Avery, to do a prayer and blessing for you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you today. And I'd like to read, um, or just quote you a scripture verse before I pray. And it's found in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And it says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope in a future. And I think we need to be encouraged in these challenging days that we find ourselves in. These uh, pandemic days. So I want to remind you today that God has a plan for us. It's a plan to prosper us. It's a plan to bring us hope. And it's a plan to give us a good future. So let's trust in Jesus today. And I hope that you are blessed in what takes place during this service today. So Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you that you are a loving God. And we thank you that greater is he who lives within us than he who lives in the world. And Lord Jesus, I pray that we would not lose sight of that. And we thank you so much. And we know that you are coming again soon to redeem us and to take us home to be with you to rule and to reign with you forever. And we thank you and bless this service today and bless everyone that's in attendance today. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
my life, my Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Good day to all who are watching um, online. Um, I will be sharing a few verses on uh, David's psalm, Psalm 139. Uh, you know, when David wrote this psalm, his heart was filled with awe before God, who uh, created us and knows us uh, very intimately. Uh, a God who is very interested in us and uh, loves us so much that we can never escape his gaze. He's always after us. Um, and the psalm begins with, um, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. It's because he is the one who created us and um, called us to life. I would like to focus our um, reflection on uh, verses 13 and 14, where David says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. We are fear fearfully made. Each person is created by God in love. When we think about God's work in creating us, his purposeful, careful attention to detail, how he knitted the tiniest living cells together, slowly, thoughtfully, the nerves, organs, the blood that runs through our veins, his breath that fills our lungs and keeps us alive, it should make us wonder and stand in awe before him for our existence. And each of us, we have been gifted by unique features and attributes that uh, we can say God didn't just put us in a machine and we came out of the same mold. But he took time uh, to make sure that there is something unique about each person. We differ in our build, the color of our eyes, the color of our skin, the texture of our hair, blood type, personality, giftings, abilities, male and female. Each one made special and all equally loved by God. The very delicate way in which we are made also makes us fragile. Our existence is precarious. Any threat to God's exquisite creation should make us care not only for ourselves, but for others as well. We are vulnerable to disease, to physical harm, evil thoughts that corrupt the heart and mind, destructive acts that aim to frustrate or destroy God's good purpose for us. What purpose? We are wonderfully made. We are wonderfully made because God's loving act of creating us binds us to him. He created us for eternity. He desires that we fellowship with him forever. He loves us so much that we are not left on our own. Rather, we belong to him. God is constantly after us, wooing us to himself, calling us to a faithful relationship with him. And in doing so, his disposition towards us is always gracious, never imposing, never oppressing or exploiting, but caring and loving even as he disciplines us to refine, transform, and renew us. What a wonderful, intricate, delicate, awesome creation we are. Praise be to God. We should be praising God every day. We exist not out of a random act by God, but by his decisive act to create us with loving intent and purpose. He even honored us by setting us apart from all of his creation, giving us the capacity to respond to his call, to respond in obedience. The stuff we are made of is not just a composite of cells or matter that decay and die, but an inner being called to obedience. More than just the human anatomy, there is a moral imperative to respond to God in freedom. That response might be one of disobedience, but disobedi disobedience will never cancel or nullify God's will to have a faithful relationship with us. His faithful love endures forever. 
As God inclines to us in love, we should reflect the image of God in us by also seeing our fellow human as a wonderful, marvelous creation, treating each other with love, paying careful attention to the other's needs, giving space, working for peace and reconciliation in all forms and resisting all forms of injustice. When we see every human person as fearfully and wonderfully made, it should concern us that our neighbor is hurt or their life cut short by the abuse of power. It should concern us that systemic barriers exist in our institutions and communities and leave others voiceless and marginalized. It should concern us that people suffer from illness, from the coronavirus, or any disability that makes life very difficult. It should concern us that racism, ethnic cleansing, religious persecution, and oppression of all kinds are evil forces and they operate in our world. It should matter a lot to us that there are others who don't yet know the love of our Heavenly Father revealed in His Son, Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit. We are not only to seek our neighbor's earthly flourishing, but more than that, the eternal well-being as well. Apart from God, there is no life. Human life is precious because it is of God. Black lives are precious. The lives of Christians are precious. Rohingyas and Uyghurs are precious. Their lives are precious. The lives of children and the elderly, widows, orphans, the poor, their lives are precious. Persons with disabilities, their lives are precious. Your life and mine, it's precious to God. With hearts that grieve for all that afflicts life, and in repentance for our indifference to and lack of regard, lack of care for the plight of our neighbor, for all that corrupts God's fine handiworks, let us seek him who knows us very intimately because he created us in love. And so we pray these same words of David in verses 23 and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God bless you all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to dig into 2 Samuel chapter 23 together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can be together as the body of Christ to uh, lift up your name, to give you the praise and honor that you are due. We come to you today, uh, Lord, as ones who uh, amazingly are called saints, uh, are called your ambassadors, uh, have heaven as our home. Uh, that we uh, do not live as others do that have no hope. Rather, our hope is in you who rose from the dead on the third day, have ascended to the right hand of the Father, and you have made a promise to us that you will take us to be with yourself. In fact, your prayer to the Father in John 17 was that we would be where you are. And when we think about the implications of that, Lord, that we are mindful that this world is not our home. Our time here is short, but it is also a time when we know that we are to be busy in your name, representing you. And so we pray for strength and courage to live up to the calling that you've placed upon us. Find us uh, pursuing after you from our hearts with devotion and sincerity and faithfulness. We desperately need your help for we every day are struggling with sin in our life, wrong motives and sexual purity and all manner of things which we know are against your will and yet we keep on and and so we ask that you would cleanse us, that uh, you would put within our hearts a, uh, a fire that would see us pursuing after holiness and doing what is right in your sight. We come to you as well as ones who uh, would uh, intercede for uh, Jerome this morning, uh, whether, whether she's had her baby or, or is still waiting to give birth, we pray for strength for her as she and Albin uh, begin uh, their uh, calling as parents and we pray for the safe delivery of this young one. We think of the, the Igers and uh, the Rohingya in um, another part of the world. We think of the, how they are being mistreated and abused. And Lord, uh, our hearts are troubled and pained by the oppression that is happening. We pray for an end to the regime that would, the regimes that are doing so. And we think 
Our, our hearts are, are, are torn by things that are happening far away, but we realize here in our own country there are uh, awful things that are going on as well. And so we pray you would give us eyes that are open, that we would stand up for others that are being oppressed, uh, and particularly injustices that uh, then we read in your word that we know that such things should not be. And so we pray for courage and strength to be found taking our stand, but not taking our stand as individuals, but taking our stand as ones who are in, in Christ. And so it is because it is you who is our king and you and your glory is our, always our motive. We thank you for this day. We, we pray now that as we look into your word that you would speak to each one of our hearts, draw us closer to you, and uh, we uh, just bless your name and thank you for all that you've done for us. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 23. And uh, I've added a little fun byline underneath for our title uh, because it features some amazing soldiers. And, and some, when we read this passage today, there's a lot of names that you're like, uh, wow, that's a, that's a wild name, um, but they're there for a reason. And then there's the exploits of, these are the exploits we're going to in, in look at today, of David's mighty men. And so if you like to think in modern terms, you think, okay, this is a lineup of the Avengers, the ultimate Avengers lineup, right? <laughs> these are the super warriors. These are the, uh, so that's why I said the, the ninja warriors, the kung fu masters, right? Like these are, this is the cream of the crop. The, the most impressive uh, group of soldiers uh, gathered together, and they gathered together as one's loyalty, uh, whose loyalty was to David, devotion was to David, devotion to, their, to the Israel, devotion to God. And we have this impressive list of, here are the, the mighty men of David. And you ask, why would we consider this ancient battlefield group? Uh, because this group of men actually has a lot to teach us about how to live as the followers of Jesus Christ. Whenever you read your Bible, always ask the question, okay, I know I'm reading about, I don't know who they are, I don't even know how to pronounce their name properly, but what is, how do I apply this as a follower of Jesus Christ? And once we start asking those types of questions, what are the eternal principles and applications of the passage? All of a sudden we've got ourselves a treasure trove of, okay, now I know a little bit more about my, uh, living for Jesus in the year 2020. Um, and so as we finish up, we're gonna look at this. There's 37 men that are noted. Some are more famous than others. Some come with a story, an account of their life and exploits. Um, there's no finer roster of soldiers compiled. Uh, they not, not, one neat thing is, not all of them are Jewish. And that I find significant in itself. David, um, right from the get-go, uh, when he was being chased, he'd been ordained as king. He went to work for Saul. Saul turned on him. And then David fled. But God began to send people his way. And we read about the 600 people that were with David when he was in the wilderness. And David's numbers, those that were by his side, continued to swell over the time. Why? Because David was charismatic and, and had this sort of uh, personality field around him, like um, the uh, old Apple guy. What was his name now? Uh, I Steve Jobs, was, was, that, was that the case? Was it, was it, was it David? Thank you. Was it David had a Steve Jobs sort of aura about him? No, it's because the Bible says that God drew these people to his side to support him. And, and, oh, and so these, some of these folks, they weren't, they weren't Jewish. And the, and the point of that is, is we're reminded of God's great plan of salvation, not just for Jewish people, but salvation for people from every part, every tribe, every nation of the world. And so this gathering of these who are just, you're like, well, they're just soldiers. No, but they're, the composition of the group points us to something bigger, to God's plan of salvation itself. Uh, the, in terms of the 37, three of them are absolute champions. As you know, you know they, you've heard that phrase, an absolute champion. Well, three of them are, you, you were like, in breathless tones, you'd be like, and you know about him? and him, and him, and you're like, whoa. <laughs> if I'm gonna go down a dark street, I want that guy with me, right? In fact, I would be happy to have any of these 37 guys with me, 
if I was in the wrong part of town. Um, and because I would feel pretty confident that if they were with me, I'd probably be getting home okay. Uh, and that's, uh, these, these were the finest, finest fighting group that, that was around. And so, but there's three that stand out, and then there's two others that are part of the, part of the three, but they're not quite, they're just like one step below, but they're, they're equally as famous as, as the three. Now there is one guy, just as an introduction before we start reading and start unpacking the text, there's one guy who is missing in this list of David's mighty men. And there's a reason he's missing. He's mentioned, but he's always mentioned by extension. It is Joab. Uh, when we think about the, the mighty men of David, you've read with me um, that Joab did this and Joab did that and Joab led this conquest and Joab rebuked David and, and you're like, certainly Joab. No, he's not listed. He's not given the honor of being included in this list. Why? Because his motives and heart were far different than these men. You see, when David elevates these men and says, here's people I want to honor and lift up, Joab's not in their company because Joab was a cold-blooded murderer whose every motivation in the end, it turned out, was not really about David or God, or it was about Joab. And Joab's motives in the end betray him and show him for what he is. And so he is, as, though he was incredibly successful on the battlefield and as a general and as a leader in the country, he's not the one whose name is being honored because he's missing the most important qualities of being, uh, of, of devotion to God and of ultimately of, of loyalty. And we're going to talk about loyalty and how important that is. And so that's kind of a notable thing. The other thing is that's really important is there is a parallel account of David's mighty men in 1 Chronicles chapter 11. This is important to know because your skeptic friends who like to poke you in your faith, um, the, a skeptic is someone who is, uh, has decided they refuse to believe. It doesn't matter how much logic is used. They're just, their mindset is, I don't believe, I'm not going to believe. And in fact, I'm going to go out of my way to upset any Christian friend that I have in my life. And so they will, um, and, and, and if you haven't heard it, well, you're, maybe, you're hearing it first here, but you're, you're, you bump into people who are like, do you know the Bible's contradictory? And you're like, what? And you're like, well, did you know that there's a contradiction between the, the list of, of accomplishments of the warriors of chapter 23 and 1 Chronicles 11? And, you're, and, and if... If, we, if it wasn't me telling you this morning, you'd be like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. Tell me about it. Well, here is in a passage. One guy is said to have killed 800 men in combat in one encounter. When you read in Chronicles, uh, in 1 Kings, uh, it, it says this guy killed 300 men in one encounter. And you're like, that's, that's a pretty big difference, actually. Uh, 500 people different. And so then your skeptic friend's like, you see, you can't trust your Bible, can you? because it's not telling you the truth. Uh, and so th what's their goal? Their goal is to upset you. Their goal is to topple your faith to cause you to doubt God's word. Meanwhile, if you step back and you're like, wait a second. Um, okay, so there is a discrepancy. What might explain, is there any plausible explanations for why there's a discrepancy as, as it is? And so, we, so as, as a, someone that's like, wants to get past the shock of someone trying to offend you like that, or, or wreck your day, your faith, and you're like, okay, how do I explain that? Well, a few, a few good things to understand. Uh, the account of uh, David's mighty warriors, and there is some different names listed in Kings. The account of David's mighty warriors in 2 Samuel 23 is from the end of his, the end of his reign. The account of the mighty warriors that are honored in, in Kings is near the beginning of his reign. And so there's, that explains some of the different names, but it also might explain the difference of, uh, of soldiers killed in single combat, and that someone as supremely talented at what he did, um, it could be that he just set the bar higher, right? He, he took down 300 one time, and then on another occasion, he actually did better, like a, like a super athlete does when they jump this high, and then next year, they somehow they've managed to raise the bar. That's a possible explanation. It's also possible that the difference between 800 and, and 300 is it could have been, um, and I don't have the answer, it could have been a copyist error. 
And you're like, whoa, now, you're, uh, now that's unsettling. What do you mean copyist error? Well, just to understand, when we have our Bible, originally given us, to us in uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Uh, most of the Old Testament is Hebrew. There's a little bit of Aramaic. And, and the New Testament, by and large, is Greek. And so we have great confidence that when we're reading our Bible, that we know that we're reading the same thing that the, the saints of the first century are reading because we have manuscript evidence that just tracks itself through history. And you can compare it over the centuries, and you're like, hey, they actually did a really good job of copying things. So that when I'm reading the Bible, I'm reading this, the, same, the same word that was given to the, to the New Testament saints. That's the beauty when you and I read our Bible. That's the answer to how do you know you're reading what they had? Well, manuscript evidence. Every once in a while, um, every blue moon, someone, their eyes go a little crazy and they flip a letter on a word. That, that does happen occasionally, but guess what the beautiful thing about manus comparing manuscripts does? It allows you to pick those out and realize that has happened. And so it's possible the discrepancy owes itself to a copyist error, but it's also possible that the guy just was like so awesome at uh, fighting <laughs> that he did, outdid himself. Um, and so, but the point is, don't let your skeptical friends ruin your faith because they're like, I found a numerical discrepancy. Um, there's, there is, once you start digging and thinking about it, you realize, oh, there actually is some plausible explanations. Uh, I don't have to give up my faith today because this guy has gone out to, make, to, to upset me. Uh, so let's have a look at the passage with that kind of um, background in mind. Now, some of these names, I'm going to totally fake their pronunciation, right? So don't go home and say you have the right pronunciation because I don't know the right pronunciation of all the names. But let's, uh, let's read um, th this passage together. These are the names of David's mighty warriors. Josheb, Bathsheba, Atakamite. He was the chief of the three. Remember I mentioned the big three? Um, he raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. 300 or 800, that's a lot of people. Uh, and it means he's really good at what he was doing. Um, and next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai, the Ahohite. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pastamim for battle. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. I explained that in the first service. If I don't have a sword, but I have hoed a field every once in a while in my life. And your hand will literally cramp up if you hold on to it too long and you don't remove your hand. This guy was swinging his sword in battle that day uh, that he, he didn't have a chance to rest. His hand actually seized up around it. And yet the Lord blessed him and enabled him to take his stand and, and God enabled him to have victory that day. And so the troops, they returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Next to him was Shema, son of Agi, the Herorite. When the Philistines, and remember the Philistines were the mortal enemies of Israel for hundreds of years. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shema took a stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and he struck the Philistines down and the Lord brought a gr about a great victory. And then during the harvest time, Three of the 30 chief warriors came to David at the cave of Adullam while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and he said, oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. And so the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives and David would not drink it? Now, let's stop there for a second and think about that. That's pretty amazing, right? David's in the stronghold. The Philistines have invaded the land. They're in Bethlehem. What happens in Bethlehem later on in history? Who knows? Who's born in Bethlehem? Jesus is born in Bethlehem, according to, the pro according to prophecy. David was from Bethlehem. His hometown has been invaded by the enemies. He is thinking about his hometown and he longs for water. 
He's like, I wish I could have a glass of water right now. And they're like, hey, we can get you some. No, 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 I wish I could have a glass of water from Bethlehem, <laughs> right? Totally un not a realistic request, right? It's, uh, and yet, as unrealistic as it was, as they, what it, these, this shows you the character of these men. It shows you the devotion. We're going to talk about what it means to be devoted to Christ. We learn from their devotion. They hear their king say, I wish I could have some water from my hometown. And they're like, you know what? We are going to go get it. So these three guys, uh, a, the A team of David's army, head out, break through the Philistines' line. Now imagine you're the Philistines, right? And you're a garrison, and you're like, there's three guys coming. <laughs> no problem, right? <laughs> no, big problem. These are the, this is the crack team, right? And, and these guys shred their way through the Philistines. And for what reason? If you're the commander, you're like, let's figure out what happened today. You're like, I think they came for water, <laughs> right? You're like, really? <laughs> we got wrecked over water? Uh, and so they come, they, they come in and they bring this water. Now, Wendy, uh, I mentioned this in the first, Wendy, uh, we grew up in the same household. Um, my parents, when I was young, um, we moved from Hamilton to Kitchener. And when you think about water, water tastes different. It really does taste different depending on where you're from. And my parents had these buckets uh, with lids. And whenever we went back to Hamilton, they would actually find a tap and fill it up with Hamilton water. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because they missed it that much. I don't know if you remember that, Wendy, or not. Um, and, and so they would, um, they, would, they would collect this water, and we would then have a little stash of water uh, so that uh, uh, we could enjoy the, the old Hamilton water. Now that I think about it, you probably don't want Hamilton water, really. <laughs> but, uh, but the point is, is David longs for it, and these guys go get it. Uh, as, and that shows you just how, how mighty they were, that they could do, the three of them could just do that on their own. And David is honoring them here by recounting this, this uh, event from his life. Then as such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors, Abishai, the brother of Joab, son of Zariah, was chief of the three. Uh, he raised his spear against 300 men whom he killed, and so he became as famous as the three. Was he not held in greater honor than the three? He became their commander, even though he was not included among them. And then there's another amazing guy. Go to the next picture, please, Otto. Is, uh, there's a guy named Benaiah. And Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, the, a violent fighter from Kabzeel, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors, he also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down a huge Egyptian, although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. Benaiah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and he killed him with his own spear. Now, how, that's insult to injury, isn't it? You're, at, and you're, a, you're this hulking monster of a guy um, and uh, you've got the spear, and there's this little guy with a club, and you're like, wait a minute, he just took my spear. Now he's stabbing me with my own spear, <laughs> right? Like, that's, that's, uh, th that just shows you how courageous and how fierce this guy was. Not afraid of the lion, not afraid of the two strongest warriors um, of, uh, of, the, of the Moabites, uh, not afraid of this monster, monstrous Egyptian guy. Um, and so he says he killed him with it. Such was the exploits of Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. He too was as famous as the three mighty warriors. He was held in greater honor than any of the 30, but he was not included among the three. So you see there's this tier, right? There's the, the big three. Then there's these two other guys who are like almost in that tier. And then there's the, the rest of the 30. But like I said, I wouldn't be afraid to go into the the toughest neighborhood, if I had any of those guys with me. I, didn't, I wouldn't need the big three. I'd be happy with the last guy. Uh, that's that's how, 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 how strong they were. And it says, but he was not included among the three, and David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Now, there's the rest of these names, and um, I just want to roll all the way down to verse 39 for sake of our time this morning. Who is the last guy mentioned in verse 39? Uriah. Who's Uriah? You, exactly. The husband of Bathsheba. You know, David is not afraid.
to make himself look bad, is he? He, he this, many years before, he had seen this uh, woman uh, out on her balcony getting a shower. He wanted her. He had her brought to his palace. He found out who it was. He didn't care. Um, the, and, and then she gets pregnant. And then her husband, who's out fighting David's wars and God's wars against the enemy, he, David brings him home, tries to make it look like it was his baby instead. Uh, but Uriah refused to go home to his wife and ends up, David gets so frustrated by this that he ends up putting Uriah on the front line and effectively murders Uriah by decree. Uh, and Uriah dies, and yet Uriah is here, listed and honored amongst the, 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 great, the great men who were at David's side and David's army. Now, why would David do that? Because David is not about himself, is he? David is not a man that is prideful. David is, not a, David is, even though it brings back the story of his utter failure, David is like, this guy must be honored, and, he, and, and, and I'm going to honor him even when it makes me look bad. That's, that tells us, when we go back to the account, remember David's dancing in front of the ark, and, and Michal is like, well, how you distinguished yourself today, right? And David's like, I'll become even more undignified because I want God to be honored, and I want God to be glorified. And I think it's just so incredible that David just shows you the true heart when it says there's a, a, he's a man after God's own heart, he's not afraid to look bad because it's not about him. You know, he's not tooting his own horn. He says, these are the people I want to honor. And even if, I, even if it reminds you of how I, I was really looked terrible at one point, I don't care. I want them to be honored. That shows us the character of David. Now, the other thing is when we look at this, this list of soldiers, you know, here's some lessons. And go to the next slide, please, Otto. Um, one we already talked about, don't let the skeptics trick you as it regards 2 Samuel 23 and 1 first, and first Chronicles 11 and the, and the two accounts. Don't be thrown off by people who are like, oh, the Bible's contradictory. It's not contradictory. There's good explanations when there's discrepancies. Uh, second thing is, what do good leaders do? We're gonna, there's a whole bunch of lessons here in our passage today. One of the things good leaders do is they share the, they share the stage, don't they? They share the credit, they share the accolades, they share uh, the limelight, and ultimately, what do, they, what, do, what do we do? We give glory to God for everything. We just don't stop and say, hey, all the credit goes to Bob and Larry and Mary and Martha and uh, Jenny. Uh, we say, no, yeah, I want to thank them, but ultimately I want to thank God. That's what, that's what David's doing here. And he's not tooting his own horn. You know, some people, they can't help but pat themselves on the back, right? I did it, and by the way, I got a little help, but I did it, right? David, when we look at David, David is an accomplished soldier in his own right. You know, what a, David was a young lad who killed a lion, who killed a bear, uh, who, that, that's what he did just as a shepherd, then David, as a young guy, goes out and kills the Philistines' greatest warrior, Goliath. And then he leads the armies of, 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 of Israel under the direction of Saul against the Philistines in engagement after engagement. But David doesn't say, listen, I'm going to give you my resume, and then I'm going to talk about a couple other people. No, he's like, here's the stage, and it's not for me, it's for them, but ultimately it's for God. You know, Every once in a while, I'm, I, uh, you know, we watch the Academy Awards or some show, and, so, and people, are, they have their, like, 30 seconds to get off the stage, right? Um, and they're like, I want to thank my mom, my uncle, my pr producer, blah, blah, blah. And every once in a while, you're like, they just thank Jesus. And you're like, wow, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, it takes a lot of courage to do that today in public. I, I commend people that, that take time to thank God and give him the glory in public. Um, and who, who realize that, you know what, all my successes, yeah, there's a whole bunch of people that have been part of my success, but ultimately, I, need to, I understand that it's because of what the Lord has done, and I want God to be honored, and I want God to be glorified. And so whatever accomplishments we have uh, happen in our life, um, we, who, who are we supposed to thank in the end? It's, we, we, we thank 
Christ and we thank the Lord for what he has done for us because our lives are being lived as Christians in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we always come back and we say, thank you, God, for what you've done and for what you've given and for helping me. And then we th and then, but we share, we share the credit with those that are along with us along the way as well. And we don't need to toot our own horn. We just need to keep on working hard and staying faithful. That's what's called. That's what we're called to. Now, the next uh, lesson is, um, oh, yeah, and that ties into number three. Never forget, the battle belongs to the Lord. Here's David's 37 um, fighting men who are super accomplished, super talented. And yet, when we think about David being established as king, having all these victories over the Philistines and the Moabites and and those that were ally, uh, allied against them, are we going to say, well, you know what? It makes sense. You got, you got, all, you got this super squad. Uh, of course David wins. That's the logical answer. But that's not the answer, is it? To, who, to whom is the credit due? To whom is the glory due? It's to God. The battle belongs... Now, there's a spiritual application there that we're going to get to in a second. But the battle belongs to the Lord. How many men did Gideon take into combat with him against the Midianite horde. 300. What did they have when they went into battle? Trumpets and pitchers with uh, like clay pots with lights, with torches. That's how they won against how many tens and hundreds of thousands? I don't know. And a countless group that had come to ravage the land and God says, God says, here's Gideon, and I want you to go, and Gideon won. And you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't compute. How does that happen? Why? The battle belongs to God. It doesn't matter the size of your army. Uh, what matters is, is, are you in tune with the heart of God and with the will of God? Or is, that, is that what's lining up? Because then you'll see some amazing ha things happen that no one can explain, and the credit is all God's. Uh, the, the battle belongs to the Lord. There's a great verse, um, Psalm 20. Mark this verse. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. David didn't put his trust in these 37 men and say, hey, I can face the world because I've got the 37 greatest soldiers that ever lived. That's not what David said. David, David's commending them and honoring them but ultimately, the point is, is that if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. And so give God the glory and remember that at the end of the day, it's, it's God in whom we trust and who we lean upon. And that ties in, you know, what a, you know, we're involved in a conflict. You know, we've got 37 soldiers who are armed to the teeth, handy with swords and spears and whatever. But you, we realize, okay, uh, and actually here's another sub, sub point, which is really important. This passage does not glorify war. It honors those who served, well, but at the very same time, it holds that incredibly fine balance of not glorifying war in itself. Uh, and, but you and I realize we are involved in a conflict. We, are, we, we, we wage war, it says, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. We are involved in a spiritual conflict. These guys were involved in a literal physical conflict, and yet translate that to our situation. We're not taking up swords and spears. But we are taking up the word of God. Uh, we are taking up the helmet of salvation. Um, we're taking up, you know, a, a, you know, there's a depiction in Ephesians chapter 6 of put on the armor of God. Take your stand against the devil and his schemes. Because at the end of the day, everything you and I are involved in is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. And the, and the battle begins with how am I doing in my walk with Christ? Am I looking to God or am I going to rely on myself? And if we're going to rely on ourselves, then we know how it's going to turn out. And we need, we need Christ to be in it. Number four, not, uh, number four um, the five super soldiers, amazing people. Um, and some of their exploits, uh, really incredible. But we have a lot to learn from them because they ultimately, they have some qualities that, that you and I would do very well in copying in our service of Jesus. Why are they in this list? They're in this list because they were loyal and faithful. They're in this list because of their courage. They're in this list because of their devotion. They're here because they were willing to take a stand when not everyone was willing to take a stand. That 
easily translates into how am I supposed to live as a follower of Jesus? Uh, for, you know, the first thing when we think about, you know, our calling is accompanied by a call, isn't it? When you and I are, were called and, and said, you know, I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ, as soon as we say, I've, I've given my life to Jesus Christ and I'm going to serve him, what's being asked of us is loyalty and faithfulness. We don't commit for a weekend or a period of our life. We don't commit saying, God, I'll follow you as long as everything is hunky-dory. We're saying, when, when we commit our lives to Christ, we're saying, I commit myself unreservedly to you. I know that in this life there will be trouble, but I'm going, with your help and strength, I'm going to stand firm and stand firm to the end. That's what loyalty and faithfulness looks like. Uh, David's soldiers were loyal to David, loyal to, loyal to, their, to, to Israel, and loyal to God. And their modeling of what does it mean to be loyal and faithful, that translates to you and I saying, this is what I need in my life as it regards following Jesus. The other thing that they were is they had something called devotion. What is devotion? You know, some people are known as, uh, every once in a while, you don't often hear it, and I've done a lot of funerals. You know, I've t- yeah, I, rarely do I hear the word devotion, and even though it may be there, so there's no criticism, but I was just thinking about it, I'm like, that's interesting. It's an interesting word, because devotion means, it doesn't just mean, oh, I've, I'm committed. It means my heart is into it completely. That's devotion. When someone is devoted to something, it means they are all in the whole way. And you can't separate, you don't separate your feelings from it. You're all in. And these men were all in. Uh, and, and that makes me think about following Jesus. The call, when you're following Jesus, you're not part way in. You're not dipping your toes into the Christian faith to see if it works for you. It's a, I'm all in, and it's, I'm gonna, my life is about Jesus and about being committed to him. My heart belongs to him. And so... How can I serve Christ? And, you know, they were talking about serving an earthly, physical king. We're talking about serving a king, the king of kings, the Lord Jesus. And so there's that typology that's happening. They're serving a a physical, earthly king, but we serve the king of kings, the Lord Jesus. Their devotion to their king is to be reflected and magnified in our devotion to Jesus Christ. And here, as an example of devotion, that getting the water, remember we talked about the water and how water, you know? When they went to get the water, why did they go get the water? It's because of devotion. That's what devotion looks like. I will do anything in the service of my king. Even if it means this guy wants some water and it's being held in a fortified town, uh, and in Beth- it's being held in Bethlehem, which is in, the Philistines are there, it doesn't matter. That's what devotion looks like. It means moving heaven and earth on behalf of the, other, of the other. And then I think, how does that translate into following Jesus? It means I'm all in and I'm, I want to do what Christ wants me to do. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm seeking to please him. And as an, as, as an act of sacrifice, of love, coming from my heart. And so these guys have a lot to teach us about how to follow Jesus Christ. And then there's courage. Um, you know, some of you may remember our dear sister Barrett, and uh, she understood what courage was. She, many people went to her for counsel over the years. When you live 100 years and you've got all your marbles and you're a nice person, people will come to you. <laughs> um, and, and so people would come to her, and she'd always be talking about the Lord. Uh, people come to her, and, and I, I guess they'd share with her what was happening in their life. And, and what I heard uh, at, at her funeral from those that spoke is he would often tell people, do it even when you're afraid. You know, do it afraid. You know, and there's a lot of things we're afraid to do, whether it's, whether it's something simple like afraid to go get my blood tested or afraid to get this checkup or afraid to talk to that person because they're going to bite my head off or whatever it is, right? Um, the, you know, courage is doing something even when you're afraid. Uh, and, and, to take a, and, to, and to say, you know what? Yeah, I feel uncomfortable, but I'm still going to do it. And I need God's help to do it, but I'm still going to do the thing which makes me shake. 
because it's, it's the right thing to do. And then the last point, and I'm going to cut short, um, is, but this is a really important, no, go back, uh, this is a really important point, is the willingness to take a stand. You know, when we think about as, as Christians, um, we're called to take a stand, aren't we? That's to be an ambassador, to be a saint, to be one under King Jesus means not living like everyone else, not believing the same things everyone else believes, not acting in, in the same way everyone else is acting. We're going to live, supposed to live different, supposed to talk different. Um, things that are, we're, we're going to be passionate about by nature are going to be different by and large from, from the people of our culture. Why? Because we are people of the word. We, our, our understanding of what is right and what is wrong in the sight of God, which is an absolute, comes from the word of God. And every once in a while, you and I are going to have to stand up and be counted. And, and that's, sometimes that's going to be difficult for us. There's a cost. Take up your cross and follow Jesus Christ. This guy, what is an, what's an example of taking a stand? He took a stand over something to be like, why in the world would I want to die in the middle of a bean field? <laughs> right? What are lentils? I'm thinking they're beans, right? Tiny little beans? Well, there's a guy, the Philistines are coming. He, he's with the army, and then he's not with the army. Because he turns around, they had all hightailed it out of there. Now, that's, think about that as Christians, right? We're supposed to be together. We're supposed to stand up for one another. Um, and we're supposed to be on the same page, like, that's, you know, whatever it is, sometimes you and I are going to be left standing alone. That's, but that's, we're going to say, you know what? If God be for me, who can stand against me? And at whatever the price is, I'm willing to pay the price because I'm devoted to Jesus Christ. This guy goes into the field with, with the soldiers with him, turns around, and there's no soldiers with him. And yet he says, you know what? I'm willing to die in this bean field today. Now, why would you be willing to die in a bean field? Because it's the supply of food for your country, right? It's, it's more than just about beans. It's about something bigger. But he still says, if I die today in this field, then I die in this field, but I'm staying in this field, and I'm going to defend it. That's, is that, can we take that to where we are as Christians? 110%. There comes a time when we have to say, you know what, I'm not giving up any more ground and I'm going to stand here and whatever comes my way, I know who I am. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I know where I'm going. I'm not worried about that. But I, there's a time when you and I have to make ourselves known and we stand up for what is right, not what is right according to 70% of people or 53% of people or what's politically correct. We stand up and say, no, this is what is right. And it may be look to you like a lousy bean field, but it's more than just a bean field. I'm going to take a stand and I'm, and I'm going to name the name of Jesus because he's my king and he's where my loyalties lie. And I'm going to serve him. And so this is probably more far more exciting a ride than you thought you'd get from a gun, bunch of guys who are a bunch of soldiers who are like, what, what is there? There's a million things for us, isn't it? And their qualities have so much to teach us about following Jesus as one devoted to Jesus Christ. And thank God we have lists like this, whether it's this list, but this list points us to something way bigger. We got the list of faith. We've got a list of warriors, physical warriors, but then you've got a list of spiritual warriors in Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith. And we, there's something in both lists that, that point us to Jesus and say, here's how you walk as a follower of him. He is your king. Give your life for him. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Give us strength to do what is right. Help us to uh, take a stand as these men did. Give us courage. And even if that means doing something, even when we're afraid, but to, to stand up and to identify ourselves as your followers, to, um, to, and also, but to work together, knowing that, it is, that it, we are your servants and uh, we love you 
And we pray that it would be seen in the way we live our lives. I thank you for each one here, each one that's tuned in. And Lord, we thank you for your word, and we pray you would use us this week uh, to encourage others to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.